I just almost pulled out this whole thing. Oh, so I should say on the on stage. I'm so glad. Nevin, 여러분께 잠시 안내 말씀드리겠습니다. 잠시 후 1시 10분부터 SDF 2018 새로운 상. We would like to begin the afternoon session of SDF 2018, a new common sense individuals changing the world. Shortly at 1:10, and we will be inviting Kathy O'Neill, the writer of Weapons of Math Destruction. So I please. Kindly ask everyone to come in and take their seats. We are providing simultaneous interpretation. You will get Korean on channel one and English on channel two. Those of you who need interpretation, please make use of the receivers. Thank you. Sometimes on your own and in crowds, 
I knew I had to have you, my hopes it'll let me down. Now you're by my side, and I feel so good. I've been nothing to hide, don't think that I ever could. Do you hear what I'm saying? Gotta say how I feel. I can't believe you're here, but I know that you're real, yeah. I know what I want, and baby, it's you. I can't deny my feelings because they are true, yeah. Dreams can't come true. Dreams can't come true. Dreams can't come true. Dreams, you know you have to be strong. Dreams. Can come true. Yeah. Dreams. 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 You know you to be strong. A short announcement. We will be beginning at 1.10, the afternoon program of STF 2018, A New Common Sense, Individuals Changing the World. The first speaker of the afternoon program will be Dr. Kathy O'Neill, the author of the worldwide bestseller, Weapons of Math Destruction. I kindly ask the participants to come in and take their seats. I repeat the announcement at 1.10. We will begin the STF 2018 A New Common Sense Individuals Changing the World afternoon program. The first speaker for the afternoon program is the author of Weapons of Math Destruction, Dr. Kathy O'Neill. I kindly ask the participants to please come in and take their seats. We are providing simultaneous interpretation. Korean on channel 1, English on channel 2. Please be advised. Uh, 
a short announcement. We will begin the afternoon program of SDF 2018, A New Common Sense, Individuals Changing the World. Please turn off your mobile phones or switch them to silent mode. You may watch all of the programs on YouTube SDF channel or SDF 2018 official website. We are providing simultaneous interpretation. On channel 1, Korean. On channel 2, English is provided. So please be advised. Thank you. I also am looking for new common sense along with you. In the morning, we met speakers who were voicing their opinion against irrational practices, stressing the need for change. I don't know if you enjoyed the morning session, but what would happen if the existing social bias and perceptions were reflected in data algorithms without us knowing and impacting our lives. Our speaker, an algorithm developer, is warning that the limitations of algorithm models based on big data can be used as a big massive weapon that threatens democracy and even mankind. I personally am looking forward to this lecture, too. If you have any questions during the lecture, please send your questions to Kakao Talk plus Chingu SDF 2018, and we will try to reflect your questions. Let's meet our speaker. Please welcome world-renowned data expert, Dr. Kathy O'Neill. Thank you. 
When I entered finance to work as a quantitative analyst, I thought I was going to bring truth and objectivity to the world using algorithms. I soon found out that the algorithms that we were selling, especially for risk, especially to measure the risk of mortgage-backed securities that were being sold all over the world, those algorithms were mathematical lies. We sold those algorithms, we created the algorithms and pretended that the mortgages were not risky because it suited our purposes in finance. It made us money. I left finance and joined Occupy Wall Street. I became a data scientist working with big data and algorithms. And I soon realized the same mistakes were, being go were going on in that world as well. I also realized that it was a much bigger problem, that algorithms were not ever objective. They were never transcending human bias the way we were marketing them as, the way we wanted to think of them as, scientific tools. They weren't truth. They were, they were opinions, opinions embedded in mathematics, where we wanted people to trust it because people trust mathematics. But it wasn't actually trustworthy. I'm going to explain that to you. Before I go on, I want to tell you what an algorithm is. An algorithm is something we use to predict the future based on patterns in the past. So it's actually very simple to think about algorithms because we use them in our head all the time. They don't have to be formalized. They don't have to be written down in code. This is my son, Wolfie. He loves Nutella. You guys know the Nutella, that chocolate spread? This will become important in a second. So my point is that I use an algorithm every night when I cook dinner for my kids, for my family. The historical information I'm using to look for patterns is the memories in my head. It doesn't have to be digital in a database. It can be just memories in your head, historical patterns. And the question I'm asking myself is, which, historically, which historical meals led to success? I'm trying to predict success. I have to define success. So I make the food, we eat dinner, and then I say to myself, was this dinner a success? I define success as my kids ate vegetables. That's not how Wolfie would have defined success, right? So there's two things I want you to understand from this. First of all, I, the success I defined was my opinion, my agenda. I'm projecting my agenda onto my family, onto the family meals. The second thing is, it's my opinion because I'm the one in power. I get to decide how to d define success. Because my kid's not in power, I'm in power. I want you to think about algorithms this way. Algorithms are secret systems that are optimized to success, but the success is defined by people who are hiding behind mathematical authenticity. They're hiding behind this assumption that is a scientific instrument that you don't know math, so you don't, you don't get to question it. But they are secretly defining success and optimizing to success based on what is successful for them, not necessarily what is successful for you. Those are two different things. Not always. Some algorithms are perfectly OK. But I worry about what I call weapons of math destruction. They have three properties. First, they're used for really important decisions. Like, do you get a job? Do you get into this college or that college? Do you get this credit card? Do you get this insurance policy? What kind of information do you get on social media? These algorithms are important to us. They deny or give us opportunities in our lives. The second thing is, they're secret. We don't understand them. We're being scored, basically. We're de being decided whether we're worthy of something. Are we high value or low value? Are we going to pay back that loan or not pay back that loan? But we don't understand the formula. Sometimes we don't even know we're being scored. That's how secret and mysterious they are. The third property is that they're not fair. They're, just, they're destructive. They unfairly deny us opportunities. They deny op opportunities to individuals that deserve those opportunities. And as a consequence, as an observation, really, 
it's not just these three properties that are satisfied, but a fourth one, which is that they actually increase inequality. They don't solve the problems that they set out to solve. And not only do they fail to solve the problems, they actually make things worse, and they increase inequality. I'm going to give you some examples. The first one comes from education. There have been a couple presidents from Republicans and Democrats in the states who have decided to get rid of the bad teachers. It's called teacher accountability. And the idea is bad teachers are increasing the achievement gap. The achievement gap is the distance between average test scores for poor kids and rich kids. That gap has been growing. It's probably about inequality more than bad teachers, to be honest. Inequality has been growing, too. But the political rhetoric is, we get rid of bad teachers, we get rid of the problem. So they develop an algorithm, a scoring system for the teachers to try to identify which teachers are bad, which teachers should they get rid of. This, uh, this system was being used in more than half of the states, mostly in poor neighborhoods, in cities. It was being used to fire people. Like this is Sarah Wasaki. She and 206 other teachers were fired based on their scores. Other teachers were fired in Texas and Chicago and Los Angeles. High stakes. But the mathematical underlying system was a terrible system. How do I know that? Well, it's not because I got to see the formula, because that was secret from me. Actually, I found out about it because my best friend runs a high school. She told me it was being used on her teachers. And I said, well, get me the formula. I'll explain it to you. And she said, I tried to get the formula, but they told me it's math, and I won't understand it. I was like, that's not cool. That's weaponizing mathematics. Your teachers deserve to know why they're getting fired. I didn't get the formula. In fact, I found out that nobody in New York City could ever see that formula. That's how secret it was. But someone got their hands on some of the scores for some of the teachers. In fact, he found more than 600 teachers who had two scores for the same year for the same subject. These were supposed to be similar to each other. After all, either one of those could be used to fire a teacher. So he made a plot of that, those scores. This is what it looked like. Each of those dots represents a teacher. You see how it's almost uniform distribution? It's almost random on that box. If it were truly random, this would mean that the score is a random number generator. Can you imagine you're working at a, comp you're working at a job, and a random number determines whether you get to keep your job? That's a weapon of math destruction. It's massively important for these teachers, many teachers. It's secret and is unfair to the individual. And as an observation I told you I would make, it's not just unfair for the individual teachers, it's not fixing the problem. It doesn't get rid of bad teachers. In fact, the best teachers leave. The best teachers get jobs at private schools, or they retire, or they get jobs at public schools that are not for poor kids. And as one more consequence, the poor kids suffer because they lose their teachers. Here's another example. This is Kyle. He had to take a personality test to get a job. This is a common thing to do when you're getting a minimum wage job at a grocery store. Not a very fancy job. He was qualified for it. In fact, he was a straight-A high school student, went to college. He had to take some time off to go to, the mental, to go to a mental health facility and get treated for bipolar disorder. When he left, he went back to college and tried to apply for this job, and he failed the test. Most people never find out they failed, but his friend told him. Another thing that was unusual about Kyle is that his father's a lawyer. Most people applying for these minimum wage jobs don't have access to a lawyer. And his father said, what kind of questions were on this test you failed? And he said, well, I recognize some of them from when I was being treated in the hospital for mental health problems. And his father said, that's illegal. There's, an, there's a law called the Americans with Disability Act in the United States that makes it illegal to force someone to take a health exam, including a mental health exam, to get a job. His father looked into it, got Kyle to apply to six other jobs. He failed all of them because it was the same test. So this is a weapon of math destruction. It's important. It's secret. He doesn't know why he's answering these questions. And it's unfair, not just to Kyle, but for the entire population of people 
who fail that test. Exactly the population of people that was meant to be protected by the Americans with Disability Act. Just a couple weeks ago, Reuters reported that Amazon built an algorithm to hire engineers. And they built it with their own data on their historical basis. Everybody who'd ever applied to be an engineer at Amazon. And they defined success somehow, probably a, a way that we typically define success in these scenarios. Someone who stays for a long time, gets a raise, gets a promotion. It sounds like good choices, right? A reasonable data set, a reasonable definition of success. They built their algorithm, and then they looked at it, and they realized it was sexist. It, in fact, they realized that if you had gone to a woman's college, you got negative points for that. If you used a word that men use on their resume, but women don't, like executed, that word, for some reason men use it on their resumes, but women don't, then you got extra points. So it was biased against women for men. Now, I want to say for the record, I'm proud of Amazon for checking. But I also want to say that algorithms do not make things fair. They do not magically make things fair. They automate the status quo. They just make, they propagate whatever you're doing already. So if what you're doing already is sexist, then the algorithm you build from what you're doing will be sexist. We should assume that's happening. We should assume the bias that persists in our culture will persist in the machines that we build based on our culture. This is a different kind of problem. It's a bias, but it's a missing data bias. This is about policing. In the United States, in almost every large city, there are policing algorithms that look at the location of previous arrests and send police to those neighborhoods to look for crime. The location of previous arrests to look for crime. Now notice I'm, not, I'm differentiating between arrests on one hand and crime on the other. That's because different populations get arrested for different kinds of crimes. In fact, it's easier to say it this way. There's a lot of missing crime data out there. Arrests are not very good proxies for crimes. Even murders, murders, where you know there was a crime, only lead to an arrest about 60% of the time. Less than 50% if the victim was black. Moreover, we have a history in the United States of racist police profiling, where we arrested black people for low-level nonviolent crime at much, much higher rates than we arrest white people. And this wasn't a mistake, this was actually a theory of broken windows policing. The theory was, if you arrest people for nonviolent crime, you will not have violent crime later. Whatever it was, it happened, and the artifact of that, the data artifact, is that we have way more arrests in poor black neighborhoods. So if you're using the location of arrests to send the police back to the the, those same neighborhoods, then you're continuing that uneven policing system but now you get to call it scientific. It's not scientific. It's a weapon of math destruction. Used in almost every city for important things. Secret in the sense that the people who are in those neighborhoods don't know why there are extra police there. And absolutely unfair. Downstream from that, from policing, there are a bunch of algorithms that are called crime risk algorithms. They're being used by judges to decide who gets to go home after arrest awaiting trial. It's called bail. Who gets bail? Who gets parole? Who gets to leave prison early? And how long do you get sentenced in the first place to prison? You could, and the, here's the thing. If you have a high crime risk, which really means high risk of getting arrested within two years of leaving prison, then you get sentenced to longer in prison now. That's already strange because you're talking about punishing someone in advance for something they haven't done. But also, if you look at the way these are constructed, they ask questions like, did you get suspended in high school? Did your father go to prison? Do you have a bad attitude? Do you come from a high crime neighborhood? They're all proxies of race and class. This is just one example of how come that's a proxy for a race, whether you were suspended in high school. Those are the questions that are asked on this scoring system. 
again, a weapon of mass destruction. And one of the worst cycles, destructive feedback loops of all. Because I'm, what I'm explaining to you is, because of where you were born, the color of your skin, you get a higher risk score. You get sentenced to prison longer. And then once you're out of prison, because you've been in longer, you have fewer connections to your community, fewer opportunities to get a job, and you end up back in prison. And the worst part about this is that that feedback loop, high score actually sends someone back to prison, is good for the data scientists who built that in the sense that they are told to make things as accurate as possible. So this feedback loop actually makes their algorithms come true. They're not just predicting the future, they're causing the future. That's what all these algorithms do. They don't just predict inequality, they cause inequality. The final example is the hardest example, what's happening on social media. This morning we heard about how wonderful the, out, the internet is for connecting people who have similar opinions, and that's true. For activism, it's a very useful tool. But once we're connected, once we're identified as having common interests, we, th that information is used by people to manipulate us with bad information, with political information, whatever they want to use us for to target us if we have an addiction to gambling, or if we're desperate for a loan, or we, if they just think we're vulnerable to a conspiracy theory. I don't know how to fix that, but I do know that the platforms that exist, like Facebook and Google, need to open themselves up for social scientists to come in and test the if effects and influence, especially around elections. I'm not hopeless, I wouldn't be here if I were hopeless. I wrote the book to alert people to this, and the first thing we need to do is stop blindly trusting algorithms. The public needs to stop blindly trusting algorithms. The data scientists need to realize that they have an ethical responsibility. They need to take a Hippocratic oath of data, data science, whatever that looks like. I have some ideas, maybe we could talk about it in the question and answer session. We also need rights. We need to demand rights, especially for potential weapons of mass destruction. What I mean by that is algorithms that are making really important decisions about our finances, about our liberty, our freedoms, and about our livelihood, our jobs. Anytime those kinds of high stakes are present and there's an algorithm deciding whether we deserve something, we should be able to ask, how does this work? Is this fair? What's the data you're using? What would have happened if something slightly different had ha happened? What would my score, how would my score change? I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Yes, please join me in giving a big hand to Dr. Kathy O'Neill for the great lecture. Many here in Korea were very excited about uh, your visit. Did you hear about that? It's it, very exciting to be here. And uh, I have to say that I'm treated like more of a celebrity here than in New York City where I live. But that's wonderful. Thank you for having me. Yes, uh, thank you. I would like to ask you some questions, including the questions that we uh, received from the floor. First of all, you talked about companies and enterprises that make use of algorithms to their advantage. But anyway, uh, the general public, we continue to use these applications and websites. But as we do this, uh, are there any tips that you can share with us that we can minimize the damage and see the most effect? 
Well, first of all, I'd like to say that most of the algorithms that I mention here and also that I wrote about in my book and the ones I worry about the most are typically not online. And they are actually being used in an offline fashion. So like when you apply to college or when you apply to a job or when you apply to get a credit card, you actually technically might be applying online. But it's not the same context of like data collection that many people think about when they think about algorithms. Um, of course, there are are algorithms that are online, and you know the Facebook newsfeed algorithm is one of them. Um, political campaigns collect profile information about us, and then they decide how to target us. Um, so that also happens to be online. Um, but the reason I mentioned that it's not necessarily online is because it's mostly a question of power. It really is. It's a powerful entity that you're asking for for something from. You're asking for a job. You're basically, you don't have negotiations power. And for that reason, it's really difficult to give advice. Like, how do you give advice about a, a negotiation where you don't have the power? Um, so it's, for me, it's not about what an individual can do. It's what we have the rights as a community to demand of such decision-making processes. When we are required to provide our personal information on websites, are there any particular parts of info we should really be cautious of sharing? I have another sort of bad news to say about that, um, which is that the whole um, point of big data, what it's really good at, is inferring um, very deep information about us from seemingly shallow information about us. That's why the Amazon algorithm could detect gender, even though there was no place on the resume where someone says, I am a woman applying for this job. It infers gender. Um, so it's very difficult to understand what kind of information we should or should not share. Because even information that looks safe might not be safe. And even if it's safe today, in 10 years, our technology is going to be even better at inferring. So in 10 years, we might you know, a company might be able to figure out in retrospect um, information about us. Um, so I, for all these reasons, the power issue, the inference of big data, I tend to focus less on the data itself, although I'm, I have no, no problem with data protection, but I don't think that will be a solution to these problems. I like to think much more about how we let people use our data, how we, how do we, contain the choice, the decisions made about us with algorithms? Um, and how do we restrict that? And how do we make those algorithms accountable? Actually, uh, for the critical websites, we do provide and uh, we do at times share our personal information. But I'm thinking there may be some uh, categories that can be taken advantage of. Sure. I mean, let me put it this way. Um, we certainly wouldn't want um, to tell a website, a random website, about our, our health status. Um, on the other hand, it will pro the, if it has enough information about our purchasing habits and our, our, our consumption habits and our exercise habits, they might be able to infer our health status. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what I mean. So I'm not saying we should give everything away immediately. I'm saying that even if we think we're protected, we might not be as protected as we want. And I should also add that it's contextual, deeply contextual. So if you talk to medical researchers, they will point out that it's good to have medical algorithms that can help that your doctor might own and your doctor might keep you healthy uh, say if there's a risk score for diabetes your doctor using that might keep you healthy but if that same information that same algorithm is used is owned by health insurance then they will just make health insurance too expensive for you so i don't i don't want to um, suggest that algorithms themselves are evil it's much more about how they're being used so i keep going back to that we need to control the context that algorithms are used to deprive us of rights and of options. This is very interesting discussion. So Dr. Kathy O'Neill, before she started the work that she is doing now, 
has been involved in financial services product development. And I believe that you still have former colleagues who are still working in that field. Do you have anything to say to them on that profession or based on your experience in the financial services field? One of the things I've realized, um, having left finance and joined Occupy and then become a data scientist and then left data science, at least I'm actually still a data scientist, but not working at a company, um, is that they're not that different um, and that people um, don't like to think of what they're doing is take, as taking advantage of the public. But I think more or less we learned that during the financial crisis about finance. Um, and then I left finance, joined data science, and in the, silico in the context of the Silicon Valley um, companies, I entered that field in 2011, um, and everyone there seemed to think that they were making the world a wonderful place. Um, but it's kind of exactly the same attitude, really. They're, they're building a machine that benefits them. Um, and they assume that if, it, if it's benefiting them, then it must be a good machine. Um, I think we have to think harder about what are the actual consequences of the big data um, systems that we build? Who are they benefiting? And more importantly, for whom do they fail? Recently, not only here in Korea, but globally too, fake news is a very big issue. The phenomenon of attacking those who have different opinions is becoming fiercer, and we're seeing polarization. To resolve this issue, are there any improvements that we can make in social media algorithms? So I just want to make the point that there's kind of three problems, um, as I see it, in social media, and one of them is the algorithms that are, are optimized um, to engagement, like on Facebook. So engagement is just literally how long we spend on, on Facebook. So they're more likely to serve us um, stories that will enrage us or outrage us or get us into an argument with somebody. Um, so that's a problem because it means the most outrageous articles are pushed to, the, uh, to our attention. Um, the second source of problems is the advertising industry, which the advertisements are tailored to us using big data techniques as well. Um, and as I said earlier, these um, political campaigns or the propagandists can, can tailor their message to us. They can actually send different messages that might even contradict them, each other to different people to manipulate us. They can push one theory and the oppo to, to this person, the opposite theory to that person, just to get people fighting or to get people to mistrust information itself. That's the second problem. And the third problem is people themselves. People have bias. Um, they like to think what they like to think and they share stories that agree with their opinions rather than agree with facts. I don't think we can ever do anything directly about that third problem except train ourselves to be more careful. That's not an algorithm problem. The first problem is definitely an algorithm problem. Um, and we absolutely must do a better job and demand a better job be done by the big tech companies in terms of optimizing, not to outrage, but to something much more reasonable for society. Mm. And for that matter, I think they should um, have limits on the kind of advertising that they are allowed to produce. I'm getting more questions as I listen to the talk, but I will just have to propose one question from the floor. The many problems that algorithms have, we understand the problems and what should we do to make best use of the algorithms in a most effective and also fair way? That's a really great question, and it's largely undecided. It's such a new field, we don't really have standards um, for what it means for an algorithm to be held accountable. Um, and this is uh, an urgent question. But I would say that the most important question we should start with, the very first question is, what I said before, for whom does this algorithm fail? How bad is that failure? Is that denying someone a legal right, a, a constitutional right, a, a human right? 
Um, so what is the chance that human rights are being um, threatened or legal rights are being threatened? Um, and for whom is this problem happening? Um, it says you, g example with the, uh, going back to the Amazon example where you have women who are qualified for this job not getting hired. Um, that, should, that should be the first question we ask. And luckily, Amazon did ask that question. But that should be a standard thing we do. It's not. But we should make that a standard thing we do. Yes, thank you. I'm afraid we are out of time. Please give uh, Dr. Kathy a big hand. As civil society focuses more on the individual, individuals are changing as consumers and office workers. Then how should corporates change? There are some companies that are trying something different. But we also have a responsibility as a tech industry to build trust in technology. Thank you. I am thrilled to be here today at the SBSD Forum, Diversity, Democracy, Data, and Dream. Let's add a couple more Ds to describe others who have shared this stage today. Devoted, determined, distinguished. I am humbled to be here with such an inspiring group of speakers and artists. Let me start by thanking Kathy O'Neill. Her research and writing has changed my thinking about the role of data and emerging technologies in our world. As someone who works for a company exploring how data can improve lives, we need tough questions like those that Kathy raises about our impact on society. These are questions that demand our most thoughtful answers, answers we should all contribute to, not just those creating new technologies. We can't afford to look at this future with uncritical eyes. We live in a time of remarkable change and opportunity. Sweeping disruption and uncertainty. We need to understand the opportunity and the uncertainty together. Over the past few years, how people work, create community, and learn about our world has been transformed. Industries have been reinvented, jobs redefined. New ways to treat disease are emerging every day. But what we have experienced so far is just a beginning. Suddenly, after decades of slow progress, rapid advances in artificial intelligence have delivered us to a point where computers will perceive, learn, reason, and act. 
already, almost without us noticing it, AI has become an important part of our day-to-day -day lives. AI powers the apps that get us from place to place. Many of you may have gotten here today through Seoul's traffic, thanks to an AI application. AI helps companies predict what their customers might want to buy or hear or watch. AI even enables spam filters to detect junk email, things that we don't want, and maybe even malicious attacks. Now that computers recognize images and understand speech almost as well as people do, the real potential of AI to change our lives is just beginning to come into focus. Here's a short video that I hope will give you a sense for what I mean. I'm Sakib Sheikh. I lost my sight when I was seven. And shortly after that, I went to a school for the blind. And that's where I was introduced to talking computers. And that really opened up a whole new world of opportunities. I joined Microsoft 10 years ago as a software engineer. I love making things which improve people's lives. And one of the things I've always dreamt of since I was at university was this idea of something that could tell you at any moment what's going on around you. I think it's a man jumping in the air doing a trick on a skateboard. I teamed up with like-minded engineers to make an app which lets you know who and what is around you. It's based on top of the Microsoft Intelligence APIs, which makes it so much easier to make this kind of thing. The app runs on smartphones, but also on the Pivot Head smart glasses. When you're talking to a bigger group, sometimes you can talk and talk and there's no response and you think, is everyone listening really well? Or are they half asleep? And you never know. I see two faces, 40 year old man with a beard looking surprised. 20-year-old woman looking happy. The app can describe the general age and gender of the people around me and what their emotions are, which is incredible. One of the things that's most useful about the app is the ability to read out text. Hello, good afternoon. Here's your menu. Great, thank you. I can use the app on my phone to take a picture of the menu, and it's going to guide me on how to take that correct photo. Move camera to the bottom right and away from the document and then it'll recognize the text. Read me the headings. I see appetizers, salads, paninis, pizzas, pastas. Hi. Years ago, this was science fiction. I never thought it would be something that you could actually do, but artificial intelligence is improving at an ever faster rate, and I'm really excited to see where we can take hey. this. As engineers, we're always standing on the shoulders of giants building on top of what went before. And in this case, we've taken years of research from Microsoft Research to pull this off. I think it's a young girl throwing an orange frisbee in the park. For me, it's about taking that far off dream and building it one step at a time. I think this is just the beginning. Today, we truly stand at the cusp of a new technology revolution that promises to transform every field of human endeavor at a pace and scale that is without precedent in human history. The benefits could be enormous. But it's also possible to look at these same technologies and wonder where they may take us. People are understandably concerned about what this means for their jobs, their information, their privacy. As we rely more and more on computers to make decisions, it raises important, difficult issues, issues that touch on safety, privacy, equity, our very democratic institutions, and the value of all of our work as individuals. At Microsoft, we see AI with potential to create a future filled with greater opportunity for people and greater prosperity for society. With Microsoft's AI for Good initiative, we're investing in AI and in individuals to address some of the world's most pressing problems. You've just seen our friend Shakib in AI for Accessibility. That's just one example. 
in AI for Earth, where Microsoft has recently invested in projects in Norway for smart grids to make their use more efficient, in Singapore to help with smart climate control in buildings, and in Tasmania to support precision farmies, farming where farmers are now saving more than 30% on irrigation costs. In AI for Humanitarian Action, we are partnering with nonprofits and humanitarian organizations to support disaster recovery, to address the needs of children, to protect displaced people, and to promote human rights. Really, it comes down to choices. As Carnegie Mellon historian Melvin Kranzberg pointed out 30 years ago, technology is neither good nor bad, nor can it ever be neutral. People can use technology to be more productive and effective in whatever they choose to do. What matters is what we choose to do with technology. But because technology has never been more powerful, the potential impact, positive or negative, has never been greater. To achieve the better future that we all dream of, these technologies and the companies that make them must earn people's trust. Trust that we're working not just to maximize profits, but to improve lives. Trust that we understand what it means to choose what we do with technology. And trust that we understand the limits of technology. At Microsoft, we believe trust begins when we listen to people and strive to learn from the customers we serve and the communities and society that we are part of. As Satya Nadella said when he became Microsoft's CEO, we need to transform our culture from know-it-all to learn-it-all. To become a company that listens, we have had to become a lot more humble than we once were. Indeed, our culture has changed a lot from the brash new company that set out 30 years ago to put a computer on every desk. Our mission today is to empower every person, every organization on the planet to achieve more. We're driven by creativity, curiosity, compassion to truly empower others. And that starts with listening and learning. Along the way, we've learned that when you change the world, you need to humbly recognize and anticipate that laws and regulations will change in response. We see this in privacy laws around the world developing as new technologies present new challenges. We've learned that being at the forefront of technology comes with important responsibilities, including a commitment to keep people safe and protect their privacy to respect timeless values and to support universal access to technology and the benefits and opportunities that it enables. To live up to these responsibilities, we recognize that we need to advocate for our customers, our employees, consumers on critical technology issues that affect their lives. For example, while we believe we should support our government views when we can, we have a responsibility to oppose them when we must. And this is why we have taken the United States government to court in litigation four separate times to protect our customers from unwarranted government surveillance. Surveillance initiated in the name of public safety, but at tension with individual privacy, transparency, and international law. We've also learned that technology is not the solution to every problem, and that we don't have all the answers. Today, it's no longer enough to simply push forward to see what a technology can do. We must ask what it should do, and recognize that there are times when there are things it should not do. This is something that we at Microsoft have grappled with as it applies to facial recognition technology. We're concerned about the potential negative impacts on privacy and human rights and high error rates for women and people of color. After much internal discussion, we decided to take a slower, more deliberate approach to this technology. 
and we've called on the U.S. government to adopt regulations governing facial recognition software in the United States. These lessons are just a beginning. Of course, as important as they are to earning trust, we know we have a lot more to learn and a lot more listening to do. We'll face many more questions about the balance between what is possible and what is right as AI capabilities advance. Deciding where that balance lies is too important to be left to a single company or to an entire industry. Everyone who is affected should have a voice. And in truth, all of us will be affected. As we all strive to understand what role AI should play in our lives, we need to learn from all walks of life, policymakers, business leaders, media, advocates, academics, educators, citizens. We need conversations. Conversations about the ethical implications of AI. Conversations about how to protect privacy while encouraging innovation. About how to protect against bias and broaden access. And conversations about how government should regulate AI. These conversations are a crucial catalyst, but they're a beginning, not an end. Over time, we need concrete steps. We need strong research in both social science and data science. We need new industry standards, best practices, policies, regulations, and we need new ethical frameworks. It'll take courage, commitment, and cooperation that crosses borders and disciplines. It'll take respect for what each person brings and what each nation values. But this isn't the first time technology has been the catalyst for sweeping social change. In 1950, concerned about developing military technologies, the great American mathematician Norbert Wiener shared his solution for the risks technology can pose for mankind. Either the engineers must become poets, or the poets must become engineers. This, then, is why I am humbled to be here in this multidisciplinary group and so optimistic about the future. Standing here in this room full of people from all walks of life, all disciplines, all striving to live and think as both poets and engineers as we seek to understand what it means to be human in a time of profound change. All striving to make sure that the, the technology emerging from companies like Microsoft reflects the best of who we are, our creativity, our curiosity, and our compassion. As we work toward concrete steps, the starting point is here, in places like this. So I have a favor to ask all of you to build a world where we do the right things with new technologies. Please help us start the conversations. They can be as structured as research or formal consultations or as informal as chatting with someone you meet here. Open a conversation. Explore not just what AI can do, but what it should do. These conversations will help us all ensure that technology contributes to our future rather than ruling over it. Here at this SBSD forum dedicated to the new common sense, you are the individuals changing the world. The fact that you are here to share your knowledge and your wisdom as we work together to balance what is possible with what is right is the very best reason that I can think of to be hopeful for our shared future. Thank you. Leave Gister, give uh, Mr. Craig Shank a big hand for his passionate lecture. Actually, there is a technology that has been give, gaining much attention from the beginning of this year, blockchain. It's, a, it's a, the transformation we see in civil society today is related to blockchain. What kind of link is there? 
Let's take a look with our next speaker. First of all, let's meet our speaker through the screen. Please welcome Mr. Chong Jae-hoon from Down Foundation. Good afternoon. Have you all heard about blockchain? What does it feel like? What's your impression? Actually, it was related to greed a lot. And people thought of cryptocurrency and of it being speculated. But actually, blockchain is not something that was born from that. I'd like to share with you today the philosophy of blockchain and how this can be linked to our civil society. 30 years ago, actually 34 years ago, uh, have you heard about cyber in 1984, William Gibson, an author, wrote a book named Neuromancer. Neuromancer is a compound noun made of neuro and necromancer. So it is about, uh, let's say, a black wizard. So you can see neuro and necromancer. What can happen? You can think, oh, it, the two are related then. Actually, it says that when the world is connected, they say that Big Brother will appear and Big Brother will uh, govern everything. And here, hackers also come out. And hackers resist this. They want freedom. At the time, Japan's Tokyo and Chiba, or uh, the dark alleys of Hong Kong were what were in the picture, and then the neon lights. This is what uh, was shown here. And this, I think, translated into Akira and also Ghost Shell. And then it went, I think, over to Hollywood and the very famous films, movies, Matrix come out from this. And it shows us and describes the dark future of our very near future. And every time uh, movies come out, you can it really reflects the time Let's take a look at what happened in the 1980s. First of all, there was global polarization that was happening. And then through, uh, because of high-tech technology, people thought that resistance could happen. And then NSA of the US, uh, there were incidents where they said that enterprises were uh, had access to the information of many different individuals. And that's what we're hearing today. Actually, there are people who resist this, and then there are people who share this. In reality, at the time, such encryption technology was something that was managed like a weapon on the part of the Department of Defense. I can see what you can see, but you cannot see what I have. And so there was this inequality. Information was weapon, and encryption technology was something that we could not give out. They could not give out to the general public. But from the individual side, encryption technology was a way to secure their own freedom. And because of that, in 1988, Timothy May, at a crypto conference, announced Crypto Anarchist Manifesto. And let's look at that. I just brought an excerpt of that. New technologies will completely change government regulations and taxes, economic systems, inter system interactions, how we maintain confidential data and change trust reputation will be changed. Technology to bring about, these technologies will bring about such revolutional change and will lead to social economic revolution. But did you know about this resistance and movement? Not many of you probably have heard of this. The reason behind this is 
because it was known only to the, to the people who really used computers a lot and people who really uh, used information a lot. But then, the internet era comes towards the end of the 1990s. And then the network era comes too. Do you know who invented the internet? Internet actually was invented by DARPA, a Department of Defense related research institute preparing for a nuclear war. But they saw the social advantage and they opened it up to the general public. And thus, the private organizations are now managing the internet. The ex-president of Google, Eric Schmidt, once said, the internet is the first thing that mankind has made yet does not understand. It is the biggest anarchism experiment in the history of mankind. However, you may all know the social use of internet, but have you thought about this philosophical and social and political side? Actually, we just use it to our enjoyment, and we're not really thinking about these difficult meanings and the truth behind the internet. Now it's 2008, and Satoshi Nakamoto writes and releases his Bitcoin white paper, and it is implemented in January of 2009, and Bitcoin's first block, Genesis block, is generated. Do you know what happened in 2008 and 2007? In 2007, there was a subprime mortgage incident, and in 2000, and then there were many financial crises after that. And then, in September 15th of 2008, Lehman Brothers went bankrupt. It was the biggest bankruptcy ever to be uh, recorded in the Guinness Book of Records, and. The there were a series of financial crises, and many of the financial institutions asked the government to provide relief aid, and Satoshi Nakamoto also. I'm, I'm thinking maybe he's a British person, but if, let's take a look at January 3, 2009, the Times headline. You can see that the second banks are on the brink of bankruptcy, and they are requesting second bailout. Actually, this is engraved in the Genesis block. You may think we could just have left them to go bankrupt. Why did we help them with our taxes? It is because if the centralized financial system goes bankrupt, it doesn't just stop there. All of the investment companies, they won't be able to get loans. There will be many different entailing issues. And they're saying the institutions, financial institutions said, if we go bankrupt, it will impact you. That's why they asked for the taxes for a uh, bailout. And that's why the government helped uh, the financial institutions. And actually, they were able to overcome the overcome their prices. Do you know what happened after the crisis? The people who actually made this incident, this big incident happen, they received hundreds of billions, tens of billions of one as bonus, and the financial systems are still in place, and they have this power. They still have this power. It has not weakened at all. Do you think this is justice? Bitcoin, when it comes to centralized financial systems and encryption technologies, if you can prove that uh, this book is stored and in many different computers through encryption technology, and you can issue currency and carry out transactions, this means that it was an experiment to show that it can actually act as a currency. So I talked to you about three different things, cyberpunk, 
internet, Bitcoin. And as I was talking to you about these things, I talked to you about anarchism. Do you know what anarchism means? Actually, we talk about it as a state where there is no government. And when we think of anarchism, we're thinking that there's no government, so there is confusion, and there must be extreme violence. It would be really dangerous, something that's even more dangerous than communism. You probably think that when we hear anarchy, but actually it is from a Greek word. Ana means to not exist, arkos means leader, and so that's where it comes from, anarchos. It means no governing authority, a society that does not require a government. So it's really different from anarchy. So once again, a leader or centralized authority does not exist, but it means a society that can grow without these leaders. But because we need a lot of time and cost to really come to a certain consensus, decision-making is delayed, social costs skyrocket, and that's why in politics, through voting, politicians are given power from us. And that is why we see the democracy that we see today. And also in the enterprises, the shareholders, they make the decisions. And also the management make decisions on behalf of the shareholder. But these people, they make cartels, and they enjoy this power. And we have seen many side effects because of this. But if with the growth of the internet, internet technology and if there is a system where we can really do uh, decision-making together, then maybe this utopia that the anarchists thought of is, can become a reality. Blockchain is a compound word composed of block and chain. In the block, everything to do with the transaction and contract is recorded, and the participating nodes own all these records as a chain. And whether this rec record, record is correct, and whether this transaction really happened with an algorithm, you can check that. And this technology actually makes and maintains this big ecosystem. Now let's take a look at the internet that we know today. The ideal of internet was quite beautiful, but what happens in reality? Look behind me. You probably have used uh, these company services at least once. One of the biggest characteristics of internet technology is that dissipation and distribution is fast, and because if networks are connected more and more, the value goes up, therefore a small number of platforms have a lot of power. And in the analog world, because if we want to publicize something and persuade people to use something, it takes a lot of time. That's why we see in the internet that it's one against all strategy. And you can see that these names actually are governing our world. So these small number of platforms are dominating everything. They are making decisions, and based on their decisions, all of our efforts can become meaningless, or even our privacy can be breached. I use Facebook heavily too, but with Mark Zuckerberg's one decision, we can all be put in da danger. So we allowed this platform centralization by exchanging our convenience, instead getting convenience and efficiency. When people say, we need to have an alternative. If we don't have an alternative, that means that they are in the end like big brother. Let's come back to blockchain now. There are many misunderstandings when it comes to blockchain. Since Bitcoin showed that cryptocurrency could be made, some think of it as a financial technology to do with the economy. And we saw many exchanges crop up. And in 2017, because of greed of many, many think of Bitcoin as something that speculators use to gain profit. But actually, the core philosophy behind blockchain is very social and political. Blockchain wants the future, a future where everyone is the owner and where there is no 
absolute power. It is a futuristic technology. So now I really urge you to think about the socio-political implications of blockchain. We need to acknowledge this and spread this. Then, only then will we be able to change our world with new common sense. Thank you. Please give him another round of applause. Thank you very much for that speech. So that was a very insightful speech on the future of activist movements based on blockchain philosophy. We will have a short break before we move on to the next part of the program. During the break, we might step outside into the lobby to go to the autograph signing session of Kathy O'Neill. So my name was Park Son Young, and the next chapter will be led by Mr. Pae Song Jae of SBS. Thank you for your attention. Ladies and gentlemen, a short announcement. While we prepare for the next part of the program, we will have a short break. During the break in the lobby, you will be able to attend the autograph signing session by Dr. Kathy O'Neill, the writer of Weapons of Math Destruction. From 2.25, we'll be listening to the chapter led by the rapper Kitty B. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, a short announcement. We will begin the next part of the program of SDF 2018, A New Common Sense, Individuals Changing the World. The next speaker is a rapper, Kitty B. I, I kindly ask everyone to please come in and take their seats. And for the next part of the program, after Kitty B's speech, we will be providing Simultaneous interpretation from Japanese to Korean. On channel one, you will get Korean, channel two, English, and channel three, Japanese. Please be advised. Thank you.
잠시 안내 말씀드리겠습니다. An announcement. We will begin the next part of the program for SDF 2018, a new common sense individuals changing the world. Kitty B is our next speaker. Please come in and take your seats. Thank you. SBS 포럼 새로운 상식 개인이 바꾸는 세상 다섯 번째 SDF 진행을 맡은 SBS의 배성재 New Comments Individuals Changing the World. My name is 배성재. I will be emceeing this fifth chapter. 언제부턴가 우리 사회에 혐오라는 단어가 We often hear the word hate in our society. I believe it means that hate has become pervasive in our world. What is hate? And how should we deal with it? We will be hearing from speakers on this theme. Please give a big hand first to the rapper Kitty B. Young and beautiful, man, Oh baby, please stop. 남들과 비교하지 마. 까만 터널 속에 나 밀어넣는 생각은 나지 마. 'Cause nobody's perfect. 우리 대체 나를 볼 때. Nobody's perfect. 다 이런 나를 볼 때. Nobody's perfect. 미워하는 마음.
안녕하세요. 아네 반갑습니다. It's great to meet you all. 안녕하세요. 저는 노래를 만들고 부르는 I am the hip hop singer and songwriter Kitty B. It's very great to be here. For those of you who don't know me, I chose this song because I thought it would best represent myself. So aside from concerts, this is the first time I am on stage to talk about myself. Since this is the first time for me, I'm very nervous and my speech might not be very smooth, but still I will try to keep it real and candid. Today, I would like to talk about the courage to believe in myself. The song I just performed was titled, Nobody's Perfect. It is about no one really being perfect, so we should stop comparing ourselves with others and just try to love ourselves. I wrote those lyrics and sing, and I also rap, but in truth, I find myself in constant self-doubt and lack of confidence. So that is where I would like to start sharing my story with you. The first story is about when I went on a TV show that was about a competition for female rappers. It was really a great, thankful opportunity to get my name and face out there, but back when we were filming it, I had such a bad time. Back then, I had no experience in broadcasting. I knew nothing about how it worked. Up to that point, I was just an ordinary person doing part-time jobs and writing music at home. So I was so taken aback at that first shoot of the program. We were filming the show for three days, nonstop, getting no sleep at all. And I was making so many mistakes and failing at a lot of things that I was trying. Back then, I kept asking myself, have I ever been so humiliated before? It was horrible. I was utterly unprepared, and everyone was watching, and I had to watch it myself on TV, and I was blaming myself so much, and reading the thousands of negative comments online. I was so harsh on myself. I was saying, why did I act like that? Why do I look like that? Why did I fail so miserably? I think it was around that time that I began to see myself as a loser, and I also started to doubt everything about my own self. So even after the show was over, it was so difficult to snap out of it. I was telling myself, you'll get it wrong again. You can't do it. So even after that show was over, I was passing over so many good opportunities because I did not believe in myself and what I could do. Then came the second incident. Someone whom I didn't even know publicly sexually insulted me multiple times. I went to pieces. It was the first time I was ever subject to such insults. It was so outrageous. But I was too conscious of the atmosphere around me to get the courage to step up and say something. But at the same time, I was also afraid that if I made an issue of it, I would be hurt even further. This is why people who cared about me, people at the label working with me, my family, they were also so concerned. So I was asking myself, is this the right thing to do to raise my voice? What will other people think? While I couldn't make up my mind, the crime, the insults kept coming, and then a voice from deep within told me 
that this should not be condoned. Better late than never, make things right. So that was when I sued the perpetrator. But I started the lawsuit without believing in myself, and I was... I had doubts on the lawsuit, and I ended up with a severe case of anxiety. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't go to crowded places, and even therapy wasn't working. When you are in severe self-doubt, the act of trying to think that is a danger in itself. I couldn't even listen to music. I couldn't even try to make music. In retrospect, I find that I was trying to evade everything that I thought bothered me. It was like I got the death sentence. So for a long time, I shut myself up. But one day, I realized I had been away from music for so long for the first time in my life. So I mustered the courage to face the music again. I refused to run away. I was playing all the music I loved so much and I desperately wanted to recover my old self. I was remembering my innocent love for music. So I took step by step out of the darkness. My inadequate self, my weak self, and when I still liked myself, I looked back on all of these me's and realized I had been neglecting myself. I started to accept myself, and that was when I started coming out of the darkness. At the end of that long tunnel, I found out that those who spilled all that antagonistic feelings on me, those who made me doubt myself, they actually can't affect my life at all. And I think that the society that we are living in often pressures people to act like they are all right when they are not, under the pretense of being cool. Sometimes we call people who can't be cool professional complainers. So sensitive people are often labeled professional complainers, and people who endure pain and who just keep silent in the face of injustice, they are often called cool. But if cool means to deceive yourself and keeping silent in the face of justice, then I refuse to be cool with that. I started to accept myself, shortcomings and all, and love myself because I have the potential to grow and to believe in myself. So I finally started working on a new album and also became brave enough to step on stage at such a great forum. I also hope that all of you will always stand in the center stage of your own lives. And for some, the song will deliver the message better, and for some, talk will resonate better. But actually, I think that I have been a lot more eloquent than I usually am, and I would like to praise myself because I've worked so hard for this, and I will tell myself I did great. See, you first have to stand up on your feet if you want to move forward, even if you need help. So I hope that all of you will be there for yourself, always be there for yourself, and believe in yourself. <laughs> Lastly, I had been so harsh on myself, and I made a song that's an apology to myself. So I would like to leave you with this song. If there's anyone who is too harsh on themselves, who don't believe in themselves, I hope this song will help. Thank you. Sorry, 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 sorry. 
너가 죽기에는 아직 too young 그 눈물은 너의 아픔이 too young 돼 아직 하지 못한 말이 줄 서. I won't leave you friend I won't leave you friend 예쁜 남짓함 조금만 보금자리 내고 난 집안 우리 부터 산지가 기억나지 않을 마치 흘러간 시간 속에 점점 말라가는 마음을 난 눈치 못 찾네 아니 너 홀로 지어리 겨디 시간을 계속 모른 채해 그만큼 말들 아픔과 함께 어거지로 궁둘러 삼키네 소화조차 되지 않은 슬픔에 매일 제한 상태로 가슴을 치네 넌더 이상 내 눈을 바라봐 주지 않네 힘없이 눈물을 떨군 채 파란 손을 힘겹게 들어올려 익숙한데 정확히 이 곳을 가리켜 손의 길을 따라가 네 주방에 꽂힌 잡지만 날이 선 팔이 떠진 어제 빨리 일어나 절박함 묻어나 초인적인 힘으로 울고 생의 날 밀쳐낸 다음 시험에 두 손의 칼 그때 거울에 미친 넌 칼을 내가 죽기에는 아직 too young 이 눈물은 나의 아픔이 too young 돼 아주 가끔은 희망이 보여 나로 사는 게 복자도 마 我们三三，刚刚遇到那三三，大人，你都在乎，都已经拿到三三，大人，你都在乎，都已经拿到三三，大人，你都在乎，都已经拿到三三，大人，你都在乎，都已经拿到三三，大人，你都在乎，都已经
It's a movement to counter racism. It is not common in Japan for a civil society movement to stage demonstrations to protest other civil society movements' activism. Those people who march through Korean town yelling ethnic Koreans should die, well, stopping those guys, it's the right thing to do. Admonishing troops, women's troops, petition troops, banner carrying troops, hate alerting troops, hate graffiti removal troops. The protesters say, stop the demonstration. The sign says, we are already living together. No to discrimination. Stop the hate demonstrations. No to discrimination. Stop the demonstrations. You kimchi pigs, idiots, go to hell. Hey, you racists. The sign says, let's all be friends. So about 1,000 counters were on the defense, shouting, stop the demonstrations. Every Japanese has the freedom to walk where they want, right? Tell them to come on out. I'll beat them to death. Is there anything wrong in saying that? Stop the hate marches. Across the street, hundreds of counters held up banners to protest the hate march. The banner reads, stop the racists. Thanks to the counters, the hate marches in Tokyo, Korean town decreased substantially. Counters expanding their activism. The counter movement started with a single tweet. Now three years, four months, and 13 days later, today. I hope this milestone bill for the eradication of hate demonstrations will pass with unanimous support. To the men who have fought in the streets against hate speech, for the complaints raised by the victims of hate speech, for the painstaking work of all the experts, all your efforts are just about to bear fruit. Those in favor of the bill, please rise and be counted. The majority is in favor, therefore the bill has passed. The session is closed. The act was passed to all things to you. Defeating the racists, the real work begins now. Let's go together. Thank you so much. Spread the news of victory. Cheers. Please give Director Lee Ilha a big hand. Uh, my name is Lee Ilha and I make documentaries. In the year 2000, I went to Japan to study. I majored in film studies there, became a documentary filmmaker and returned to Korea this year. My previous films involved a middle-aged illegal immigrant woman's struggles after an industrial accident, a coming-of-age film about kids at the ethnic Korean school in Tokyo endeavoring to make their dreams come true in the face of prejudice and discrimination and other minorities. It wasn't a conscious choice, those themes, but I think I ended up bringing in my own identity as a minority 
in a foreign country into my work. One day, 15 years after I moved to Japan, I wanted to have some Korean ramen noodles and went grocery shopping to Koreantown in Tokyo. With Korean restaurants, hair salons, Korean pancake shops, and internet cafes, it's like a miniature Korea. Thanks to the Korean pop culture wave, it's also milling with tourists from all over Japan. To Koreans in Japan, it's like a home away from home. It was there, in front of a Korean supermarket, where I first came across a hate demonstration team. The hate margers looked at me with my ramen noodles and yelled, Joseon people are cockroaches and ought to be killed. Apparently, this march was a lot of fun for them. I suddenly felt the streets of Koreantown were alien and unfamiliar. To speak of an image, it's like a drop of blank ink spreading in clear water. Or in terms of noise, it was like a disturbing high-frequency noise blocking out all other sounds. It felt like I was transported to another dimension. When you are there, seeing it firsthand, it's totally different from reading about it on the Internet. If it's on an electronic screen, you could just cluck your tongue and turn it off, so you are not involved. But when I was there, I could not turn it off. It was reality, and this was about myself. The people expressing hate were not monsters. They were your next-door neighbors, they were students next door, they were ordinary. That was even more surprising. It felt my entire existence living in Japan was being defied. So I was angry. I was sad. And the groups of people, crowds of people, having fun hating others looked ridiculous. They were staging it right on the streets in broad daylight. But then I saw another group of people on the sidewalk. They were the citizens trying to stop the hate demonstrations, or the counters. They were wearing T-shirts saying Tokyo against racism and holding up banners that read hate marches are disgracing Japan. So many counters were staging a sit-in on the street to stop the hate demonstrations. The police were actually physically cracking down on or arresting the counters, helping the hate demonstrations. Freedom of expression is a constitutional right. They have legal permission to demonstrate and must be protected, were the police's excuses. I was watching this pandemonium, and I made up my mind to make a documentary movie about it. I wanted to find out the thoughts of the hate demonstrators, but what I was really interested in was the thoughts of the counters. I was so very curious about the people who were making sacrifices to stop the hate marches. While so many others were just turning a blind eye to the hate demonstrators, who were these people who resisted? So I started research right away. I met with each and every counter. I found there wasn't any particular organization structure, nor were there any special leaders. They were just Tokyo citizens, individuals who had come together on social media. The counters would pool their skills and talent to protest the hate marches. A designer would make banners, a rapper would write songs, a lawyer would advocate, a teacher would work at school, a diet member would prepare legislation. They all found ways to contribute and grew in influence like cells would split. Each individual voluntarily came together and formed the activist group Counters. On the streets, the protests against hate were like rock music, but the Counters also took a more subtle approach, like classical music, hosting seminars, exhibitions, petitioning, pressuring bureaucrats, persuading diet members. The women Counters would carry out even more work under the radar, gaining public support. Those who had given up their weekends to stop the hate demonstrations, 
the ordinary citizens, the individuals were the ones making up counters. What prompted them to do so? Let's hear from two counters in person. Directly coming up against them is not an action for society. They stab people. And my action is to stop them from stabbing others. If there is a stabbing knife, you have to physically stop them. As a result, physical action brought down the number of hate protesters and weakened them. In short, they are no longer able to stab, forcefully stopping, rebuking these hate group members is what I can do. It is something that I must do. I have been covering the core of their claims. As a result, when it comes to the opinion of the Civil Association Against Privileges for Resident Koreans, I thought it meaningless to accept and contemplate it. People who, who use hate speech, people who discriminate, the fact that I got to know about them means I cannot turn a blind eye. Writing articles, covering stories, this is my counter activity. Thank you. Uh, these two counters members actually arrived from Japan just today, uh, Yasuda Goichi and Ito. First of all, Mr. Yasuda Goichi, good afternoon. I am Yasta Guichi. I am a journalist. Today, it is an honor for me to be able to talk to you. I am actually, before I became a freelancer, I worked at a weekly newspaper. And actually, I was mostly interested in the foreigners who are living in Japan. Actually, uh, the human rights of the foreigners in Japan is what I do. When I cover these people, I look at how the Japan society is approaching these foreigners. Uh, as a result, in conclusion, what is happening towards the foreign residents in Japan, the Japanese society is really overlooking and is not interested in the human rights of these foreign residents. And there are many who have also discriminative opinions against these foreign residents. And while I was covering this story, I actually was able to come up against this racist person who you saw in the counters movie. So as you saw, this racist group, the Zai Tokukai, Civil Association Against Privileges for Resident Koreans, they were actually uh, launched in 2006, two years after the Olympics. At the time, we thought Korea-Japan relations were getting better. And in Japan, we could see Korean dramas on TV, and we could listen to K-pop songs. Many Korea, uh, Japanese women liked Korean dramas, but there were people who thought of this as an invasion of the Korean culture. And there were people who thought and said that Korea was our enemy. Many in uh, who are part of the right wing connected to the internet and spread uh, their thoughts. And this actually fructified in civil association against privileges for resident Koreans. But what is different about Zai Tokukai is that it works online, but actually it acts offline too, in the streets. They actually march the streets and say that we have to sever all ties with Korean. Korea and that we have to kill and send out all the Korean residents in Japan. Why this association cropped up is not important. Think about this. Around 100 years ago, there was a Kwanjin 
great earthquake and there was a massacre of Koreans. It was just the civilians who killed these Koreans because they were Koreans. There has been this discrimination in our society for this long time. So this discrimination always was there. It's just changed in form. Now the network has become part of their weapon. Using the internet, now they are spreading their power. A hundred years ago, uh, when there was the great earthquake, uh, there were people who said uh, that Koreans were putting poison in the water, and that is why they needed to massacre the Koreans. Now what they're saying is that resident Koreans have privileges over the Japanese, and that they're spreading these rumors, unfound rumors, so that people hate these Koreans. Actually, they think of all resident foreigners as people who are going against the security and safety of Japanese. So they are against all uh, these resident foreigners. And also people who live in Okinawa. Uh, they, I think we can think of this as the Jala province here in Korea. It has been discriminated against, this region has been discriminated against for a long time. And that they're even discriminating against the people in Okinawa. And so I think uh, equality, democracy, these are things that they are going against, and they are resisting all of this. But uh, the Japan society did not overlook this. Of course, there were movements who went against uh, the discrimination, but it was focused on the individuals who were victimized. But uh, as you saw in the movie, we are seeing this as a society, society movement. And Ito also will talk about this, about how this actually is taking root in our daily lives and in the Japanese society. We are looking, we need to look at the behavior of our Japan. Discrimination is something that we need to go against to protect our civilians. We need to survive and for human dignity and also for human reputation, we really need to go against this. Thank you. Good afternoon. I live in Japan, and I am member of the CRAC Crack or Counter Racist Action Collective. My name is Taisuke Ito, and I run a real estate company. I would like to talk about the counteraction against discrimination and exclusionism. I first got involved in social movements around the time that the Great East Japan earthquake occurred in 2011 and the resulting uh, nuclear power plant accident. Until then, I had known the problems in society, but I didn't take any action. But after the earthquake, and the nuclear power plant accident, I found that the electronic company, electricity company, and the Japanese government was not dealing with it properly. So I found that I had to take action against such problems. And I also began protesting against these racist because in 2013 I saw on social media that people were rallying up people to stage a counter movement against racist demonstrations. So this group was going to have a counter a movement against civil association against privileges for resident Koreans or Zai Tokukai. Of course, many people had been protesting against such racist demonstrations between 2013, but they were too uh, gentle in their approach, and so they were they stood no chance against the racists. And a lot of people, including the media, said. Don't even try to deal with them. They will disappear in time. But I believe that it was time to take action. 
the new counter movement that started with the rallying on social media, media was done in a much more stronger way compared to the past. So it also gathered the attention of experts and the media. And now the term hate speech was widely understood around the world. The society began to look in a negative way on all forms of hate speech. And a lot less people were participating in those hate speech demonstrations. And also there was the Hate Speech Act passed. So this was a very good change in the positive direction. And for the past few years, I have learned that having concrete action as a citizen is very important. And at the same time, I had been very open with my own status, my name, where I worked. So I was sued by the racists, and I was also sued in defamation suits. So I was facing a lot of difficulty in my daily life. So many counter members had to quit their jobs because they were being harassed by the racists. And so to prevent more people being hurt and harassed by racists, we have to work together. If more people join in this movement, then the harassment or the difficulties will be dispersed over a wider base, and that means that each and every individual will suffer less. I really strongly hope that everyone will be able to live in a society without discrimination as a neighbor to Korea. Thank you. So you saw in the video that uh, the act was actually enacted. And actually, we really cheered that. Uh, what did you feel at the time, Ito? Actually, when I first started out as a counter, there was no act in place, so there were many difficulties. But since uh, I think uh, I thought it would take about 10, 20 years for this regulation to actually be enacted, but actually it was done in a shorter period of time, so I was really overjoyed. Another question. Since the Hate Speech Act was enacted, what changes have come across Japanese society? I think it has been most effective. This law does not uh, stipulate any punishment, but it just made clear that hate speech should not be carried out and that the citizens should make efforts to reduce hate speech. So it's about concept, and it's not a satisfactory law. However, it doesn't punish and it doesn't punish the violators. But it states that all the citizens should work to improve the situation. So the local government bodies and the police should make efforts. So the police have stepped up the their crackdown on such hate demonstrations and the local autonomous government bodies are conducting a more strict reviews when they are giving permits for the demonstration. I, I do believe that there should be amendments made to the law. And so uh, the name Zaito Kukai is actually a civil association against privileges for resident Koreans. It seems that they have privileges, but actually they don't. So it's fake news. So the people who are not really interested in the issue, they think that resident Koreans have privileges. As you saw, uh, the founding member of Zaito Kukai was in uh, the video. When I met him uh, individually, he was very gentlemanly-like and soft. When I asked him uh, questions when I was interviewing him, he told me Korea holds anti-Japan protests too. What's wrong about this? So we have always, it was this uh, cycle. Actually, now he uh, 
was came in fifth of uh, the mayor for uh, Tokyo, and he got 110,000 votes. And what these people actually want, the big picture that they want is revisionism. They are beautifying war and revive. They want the revision of the peace constitution. Hate actually started out as a small ember, but actually it can lead to genocide. What about the hate in us, though? What about the foreign workers who are here in Korea? What about the Japanese residents, the Chinese residents in Korea? I thought about the Yemenese refugees in Jeju in the reviews that the Koreans are writing. Instead of the word Yemenese refugees, if we put in resident Koreans in Japan, there's nothing different. Actually, only decades ago, many fled to Japan because of the Jeju April 3 incident. And that is why these people are actually in Japan. And every time I talk to counters, I am very proud. I tell them that our society is one that was made through candlelights. Do you think everyone, the majority and the minor minority, are happy? Counters actually did not just stop at thinking. They actually put things into action. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee Il Ha and Mr. Ito and Mr. Yasuda. So the next part, I know you can't wait for it to begin. This is a book concert with the Book Book Brothers. We have the writers Kim Min Sup and Kim Dong Sik. Please give them a big hand. Please say hi to the people who are watching the SBS D Forum. Hi, my name is Kim Min Sup. Good afternoon, my name is Kim Dong Sik. Actually, if I can introduce them to you briefly, he is a writer of I am a part-time instructor at a provincial university and the Society of Designated Drivers. He is a writer of five different books. And uh, Mr. Kim Dong-sik has written many different books, such as uh, The Grey Human Being and The Weakest Monster in the World. Now you actually uh, wrote your six books today. And at SPS, we are currently hearing voices of those who go against the society irregularities. But uh, Mr. Kim min -sop, you wrote, I am a part-time instructor at a provincial university under the name apartment number 309, number 1201. Actually, I taught as a part-time instructor at a provincial university, and I really didn't experienced many irregularities at the time, but uh, I actually was introduced through the media as a, a McDonald part-time employee who was actually teaching at a university. So actually, I did that because I wanted to get uh, assurance, insurance uh, as a part-time worker. And so I was thinking, as a part-time instructor at a university, why don't I get these social benefits when I can get them from McDonald's? And as I raised these questions, and I, as I was tight looking for uh, the solutions, I wrote this book. What is this uh, writing name that you have, apartment number 309, number 1201? Actually, it was my address at the time. And actually, I thought if I wrote uh, using my real name, I thought I would have to actually leave my job as a part-time instructor. 
in the end, that did happen. But why this happened was because I thought uh, teaching was restricted to universities. I worked at McDonald's for a year and three months. And as I made these social relationships, I thought I saw that I could really, there was this classroom out uh, outside of the university. And I thought I could really help people as a teacher outside of uh, the university. So after that, I have been writing uh, with my real name. That is why I left uh, my job as a part-time instructor. But actually, although you did use this uh, name, apartment number 309, uh, did people know you? Yes, I think people thought that was me. They would ask me questions. I would say, no, it isn't me. What about the uh, landowner? Yes, I'm sure he didn't know. Maybe he knows now. So after you leave school, you write this book, Society of Designated Drivers. Uh, so was there any change of thought after you wrote, I am a part-time instructor at Provincial University? In my first book, I was raising questions about myself as an individual. But through the Society of Designated Drivers, I wanted to look at the overall society. In the past, I tried to change myself as an individual. I wanted to change the people as individuals around me. But I learned that the structure, the system that is wrapping these people and changing that system was more important. If you read that book, you define the society as a giant driver's seat for others. So I had done about 100 designated driver jobs over the course of one month. And as soon as I get out of that car, I came up with a sentence. So this entire society is a giant driver's seat for designated drivers who are driving other people around. So I have been a designated driver, but I believed that I was driving my own car while in reality I was driving other people's cars. The thing that I always told my customers was yes, yes, so I would answer their questions very clearly. and I. And yes, right, was the second thing that I said most often because I have to agree with them. And third of all, I always have to compliment them. Yes, right, you're really great. That's what I usually told them. So in that space, I wasn't able to ask any questions. I wasn't able to raise any questions. And if I'm very nice and polite to them, then the customers feel good and they give me tips. And it's the same in our own society, in an organization, at your workplace. If you're given a task and if you perform it without asking any questions, then you will get rewards. You will get bonuses. You will get promoted earlier. So we are deprived of the right to ask questions while we are driving other people's cars. So that's the thought behind my writing in the book that the entire society is a giant driver's seat for others. So I actually did do the part-time job of designated driver, and that's actually a good tip for myself. If you go to online uh, communities for designated drivers, it's there are some tips on how to make the customer feel good and get better tips. The next question goes to Mr. Kim Dong-sik. Many different words describe you. You're a genius writer, monster writer. You uh, came up like a comet. What do you think about these descriptions? I really want to be a monster. No. Well, why did you start writing? Many people want to know why you started writing. Actually, it was just nothing. I actually worked at a plant for about 10 years, and I thought of many different things. The environment that I work in is when I go to work, I do the same work all day for the whole day. And I did this by myself, the same work day in and day out. And I thought of many different things as I was doing my work. And there, I thought of many different things. And so I started writing and put it on the internet. 
And then the response was so good, I just continued writing. writing. Uh, some, said that, some say that you started writing, continue to write because of the reviews for about one and a half year time. In that time period, I wrote about 300 short stories. The reason that I wrote these short stories, so many short stories, was because I really wanted to get these reviews. I was addicted to these reviews, actually. So that's why I continued writing. I really liked reading the reviews. What about the reviews that were a little uh, under your expectations? I actually had this three-day time frame of writing a short story. If there was a negative review, then I would upload another short story the next day in a one-day period. So if you keep on writing stories, someday you'll uh, come up with an inter interesting story. I believe there are many writers in the audience, and I think that writers are always pressured by their writing deadlines. And you are also pressured for your responses and reviews. Now, actually, it wasn't pressure, but I was really thirsty for these reviews. How should I kill my characters? How should I please my readers? So you sent a story to the Call 2 show radio program, and then it got selected. And so that gave you a lot of confidence. So. So SBS has a stake in your success. I think it would be about 7%. So hooray to SBS. So Mr. Kim dong when I read your books, a lot of people say that you have great imagination. So there are attacks by aliens. There's emergence of new my mankind in your books. But you also have a very a unique viewpoint on people, on humanity. What are your thoughts on that? I believe that people are scary because the uh, forum which I uploaded my stories was a forum for horror stories. And I don't believe in ghosts, so I believe that the most scary thing is a person. And I wanted to get better reviews and a lot of responses from my readers. I wanted to explore people. And I found that if I uploaded stories that asked questions, then it was more interactive. There were more responses from readers. And I found out that I could get better responses. And which form is that? It's in a corner titled Horror Story Forum on today's humor website. Yes, I was also quite active on that website, too. And Mr. Kim Min-sup, you were also quite active on that Today's Humor site. Yes, it was very encouraging. It was very cheering up for me to read the uh, stories on there. Yes, i sorry that I never looked at the horror story forum. I did a search on the Today's Humor website. And it was it said on the website that you are the Paul Potts of the writers, and now you are publishing in a different forum. Thank you. Please come up to me, and I'll have dinner or lunch with you sometime. Actually, uh, you both have five, uh, written five books, but uh, with the STF 2018 exclusive series, now you have written six books. Which book uh, are you most uh, attached to? Uh, the Gray Being. Uh, actually, The Great Human uh, has the most uh, reviews, uh, and uh, it had the most reviews, and it sold uh, well. So that is what I like the best of my books. Yes, response is very important. OK, Great Human. Actually, today we're talking about uh, finding and discovering individuals. Uh, both of you actually were able to find and discover uh, each other through this book concert, Finding Myself. Uh, I heard that you found uh, the other person. Actually, it's difficult to say it's discovering him, but uh, I have a bad habit. I like to read uh, the most recommended article on the internet. Uh, and actually, I read a short story on this horror story forum. And I saw, I looked at who the author was. It was really intriguing and interesting. And I looked and saw who the writer was. And I looked at the ID and I thought, OK, I don't know what this ID means. And then the next day, I read another article 
article, and once again, it was written by the same author. Actually, I uh, majored in uh, contemporary literature, and I thought I really need to remember this uh, writer and author. And I actually kept on reading the articles, and it was so fun. And he wrote these 300 short stories within this one year and a half period. And I really wanted to meet this person in person because I was thinking, physically, is this possible? And actually, I saw that uh, there was this interview session held with Mr. Kim min Sub, And I thought, I really need to go to this. And I, through his interview, I saw that, oh, this is a person who really needs to write. And I thought, I really want to have this person's book on my bookshelf. And I asked uh, Mr. Han Yo of Yoda Publishing, and I showed him uh, his short stories and told him to read through them. And uh, this, uh, the CEO of this publishing uh, house called me at midnight and he said, where did you meet this person? And that is how we decided, how he published his book. Yeah. So that's not a pen name, but an online nickname. So what did it feel like you, Mr. Kim min sub when you first met Kim Dong-sik? Well, Kim Dong-sik, he had written a lot about aliens and goblins, and I thought that he looked like a writing goblin, a goblin writer. So we first met at a coffee shop, and I recognized him right away. And I still remember what he asked me, what should I order in a place like this? He said it was about the first time he'd been to a cafe, and he was 33 years old, and he was very like a goblin to me in that aspect. Is that so surprising? Well, it's not that surprising, but yes, I think it is surprising in this time and age. I don't go to cafes myself that often. Kim Dong-sik, you had some publishing offers before, but you only made the decision to actually publish a book after meeting Kim min Sub. Well, I thought it was such a grand thing to do. It's something that I would never be able to do. I thought it would be really complicated, publishing a book. But he put it in very simple terms. I liked being told what to do. And he asked me to just pick 20 of my stories and send them over. And that was so simple. So I was able to send over the stories in 10 minutes, and it was really easy for me. It actually was not that simple, but the stories were so good, and I was such a fan of his work. And I really wanted to contribute to the publishing of his book. And the head of the publishing company said that I would be the expert on this uh, these stories, and I should be the producer of this book. I should draw up the table of contents. I should also look for the designer for the cover. And it was a great honor. I was a reader, and it was the most influential I would ever be for one of my favorite writers. So, Mr. Kim min Sub, you have been quite uh, impactful in the writer Kim dong siks life. Yes, my writers have been nurturing me. So my readers, they were so happy that I was being published. I was publishing three books at the same time, and they bought all three of them at the same time. That was a lot of money, actually. And what they told me was, thank you for letting me pay you for all of the great writing I've been enjoying for free. And I was so grateful for that. So, uh, actually, they're very nice, and they use very nice expressions. It was a great feeling. And Mr. Kim Dong-sik, I'm thinking that it was great to feel a great impression to have when you saw, uh, when you first discovered uh, Mr. Kim Dong-sik. As a reader, actually, I was very happy and satisfied, and I really wanted this writer to do well and to succeed. And I think many had the same thoughts. Many people really 
all these individuals had this mind and this mindset. And I think we were able to make a writer who can represent this century. Actually, becoming a writer here in Korea, you have to go through the Tungdan system. You have to go through these literary contests, and the people actually assess your work. And they actually have to come to a consensus and say, let's make this person a writer. But actually, Mr. Kim Dong-sik didn't go through this system. Readers actually made him into a writer. So I think that's the value. Uh, that I see in him. Actually, uh, you both have very different uh, ways when you debuted. Uh, is the publishing industry changing? Yes, actually, in publishing, I'm looking at the publishing industry a lot. Uh, although I'm not that knowledgeable, uh, many people are uploading their articles on SNS on the Internet. And based on that, I think there are many books that are published through this. And even the publishing industry is making use of uh, the Internet to publicize their books. And being able to express yourself on the Internet, making that into books, I think that is uh, the trend of the times. So, Mr. Kim Dong-sik, now you're a full-time writer and you still check the online comments every day? Yes, I do. I'm always on social media, I'm always searching on blogs, and I always click on like. And, you know, some writers, some readers like my work and some readers don't. And sometimes I'm overwhelmed by all the compliments that my fans write for me. So I check my, I search my own name online about five times in every hour. You are really honest with us today. So Kim Dong-sik's fans would want to know how you respond to their responses, and now you have the answer. So since we're talking about finding and discovering individuals. I think the power that individuals is actually larger than what we think. And I think we can change more than we actually think we can. Uh, what do you think an individual, what impact does an individual have on another individual? Actually, last year, uh, I met another person other than uh, Mr. Kim Dong-sik. I met uh, Kim min -sup, another Kim min -sup, uh, another person who has the same name as I do. I actually would like to share this story with you today. Actually, up until last year, I have, hadn't traveled overseas even once, and I didn't really like traveling, and I really liked my office in the university. That's why I didn't leave Korea once. Uh, I looked at where a good place would be to travel, and I saw Fukuoka was a good place, and I saw that there was a very uh, cheap plane ticket, and I bought that plane ticket. But uh, my second child actually was ill, and my second child's uh, surgery date was set to two days before the day I had to leave for my trip. And I was thinking, what should I do? And I thought, yeah, I should go to the hospital with my child. And I called the travel agency, and they told me they could just reimburse me by uh, only give me $10 back off the $100 ticket. And I thought, this is wrong. And as I left university, I thought, let I will not be angry to others, to people who are similar to me. Even if I'm angry to someone, even if I get more pe more money back, I will, of course, get more money back, but the irregularity of the society will not uh, be alleviated. And I really wanted to keep that emotion and really change the society. So I thought, can I actually give this to someone else, give my ticket to someone else? And they told me that person has to have the same name, that person has to have the the same uh, English uh, spelling. I use S-E-O-P for SOP. And SOP actually can be written in many different ways in English, S-E-O-P, S-E-O-B, for example. And I thought uh, I really need to find another Kim Min-sop with the same English 
spelling to send him on a trip. And actually, I found this person in three days' time. He was a person. He was a university student, and he needed money. He was actually taking time off of university because he needed money to prepare for his graduation exhibition. And I thought this was really wrong. I thought there was something wrong because for a person to stop his studies to prepare and gain money for a graduation ex exhibition, I thought that was wrong. And then there was another person who said uh, that he was a high school teacher. And he said that uh, he wanted to provide uh, three, about $300 to, a, to this person who for accommodations. And then there was a person who said, I actually went to Fukuoka. I have a green pass that this person can still use. And then someone said that I will lend my uh, Wi-Fi uh, to this person. And then there was a person who uh, gave me some uh, tickets to uh, the one of the sites, the sightseeing sites in Fukuoka. And then Kakao actually contacted me, saying that let's actually spread this story. Let's get more sponsors to help this Mr. Kim Min's help. Not only for this person to go on his trip, but also let's help him for his uh, graduation exhibition. And in three days' time, we were able to gather about um, $3,000. And before he left, he told me I actually saw a lot of faces as I was coming to the air airport. And I looked at all of their faces because I thought maybe that person helped me to go on this trip. Maybe that person actually helped me and enabled me to go on this trip. And every time I looked at the people's faces, the faces that I don't know, I thought, Oh, I hope that person also has a good uh, opportunity, too. And he told me, I also, in the future, will find another Kim min who was born who was born in 2003 and help that Kim min to go on a trip, too. And I think connecting and this connection between individuals and sending just one individual on a trip actually enables this person to dream of his future. And even a writer can be made through the power of individuals. Thank you. I think uh, my answer was a little long. So it was the Kim min -sup project. In a very short while, it was able to change the life of someone, all thanks to the help of individuals. And I have a question for Mr. Kim Dong-sik. According to our SDF team, this spring, April 2nd, when they first met you for the publishing on SDF platform, and recently, comparing when we met with you, you've changed very much. Yes, I'm a lot less shy. I'm a lot more talkative. So this is the talkative me. This is a big change. It's a change for the better. Is this also thanks to the connections? Yes, then I will have to increase SPS's stake in my success. Thank you. So network, connecting with online readers, it was very significant for you. Yes. So how influential were your readers? I think they take up about 80% of my success. Is that too much, maybe? So SPS's stake is only about one-tenth of that. Understood. I would also like to ask Mr. Kim min -sup. So what's different from when you first met with us? Uh, Mr. Kim dong -shik, how has he changed? Actually, I was able to see who he was in the cafe when I first met him. I looked for a person who was dark, and I thought, oh, it's him. And I knew it was him. Actually, but he's become brighter, and he talks more. And when I met with him with the uh, CEO of the publishing house uh, for two hours, I heard that he didn't talk a lot. And I actually didn't have much to say to him. Actually, words. For the people who actually focus on the written word, uh, it's difficult for people to express themselves in voice. Yes. 
Okay, then. As I've been talking with both of you, I think in the past maybe individual, the word individual was thought of, had a negative connotation. But now maybe I think uh, that is changing. What is your opinion? When we say individual, well, in the past, individuals, it was difficult for individuals to gather, but now individuals can gather through uh, the space that we call Internet. And I think that is the power of individuals. As I mentioned to you previously, making a writer, changing a young person's, a young man's life. I think that's the power of individuals. Now we have this space where these individuals can come together and gather. And I think we can really check and confirm the power of individuals through this. We really did want to have a longer talk with the two writers and hear more about their work. However, we are running on a very tight schedule, so I'll just have to ask you the last question. What is the new common sense from your point of view, Kim Dong-sik? You probably don't know me very well, but I dropped out of middle school, I never read, and I was only working at factories. And when I was uploading stories online, nobody was really telling me anything in specific. And also when I published, I thought that people would say that just anyone can publish now, but I see that the world has changed because no one was giving me negative comments on a person like me publishing, and I'm thankful for that change. Thank you. So this new common sense, do you mean it's changing constantly? It has already changed, it, and it will continue to change. So... That's the present progressive. Uh, for you, what is this new common sense? I think all of us are actually connected. Rather, than, We don't have this physical connection, but we have this loose and intangible, very small and thin rope that connects us. And when somebody pulls on this rope, we can look at that person and think, oh, when they pull on this uh, rope, we can think, oh, there's that person over there. I hope that person does well. And I think this is the foundation of our society. Actually, the people, the many people who helped me, the people who helped the other Kim min Sok, many people said, I hope that person does well. I really hope you do well. And what I would like to say to the audience, to the people who are here today, and also to the people who are watching online, I hope all of you do well. Thank you. Thank you. If only we had more time, we would have had a much longer talk with the two Book Book Brothers. Please give them another hand, big hand. Thank you so much for your time. So, the next part is for Kim Chang Wan Band, SDF 2018 through the lens of music. Kim So Un, the announcer Kim So Un, will be the MC for that part. And I'd like to give an announcement on the intermission. Out in the lobby, you may attend the autograph signing session with Kim Dong Shik and Kim Min Sub, the two writers. And the special edition short story collection. Based on a collaboration between SDF and Kim Dong Sik, will be released for the first time today. And I also hope that you will take note of the books by Kim Min Sup, the greatest discoverer since Columbus. Distinguished guests, the next program uh, will be heard, and we will have a short intermission for 10 minutes. The Book Brothers will be holding a, an autograph uh, signing session outside of the hall. The intermission will start at 3.40 and last up until 3.50. At 4 o'clock, we will start the session STF 2018 through the lens of music. And I would like to ask all of you to come back to this uh, hall by 3.50.
Ladies and gentlemen, a short announcement. We will be seeing the next section, STF 28, through music. Please come in and take your seats.
A short announcement. STF 2018 through music is going to be live broadcast on SBS. So I ask everyone to please come in and take their seats.
여러분 안녕하십니까? SBS D 포럼의 진행을 맡은 김소원 of SBS and I am the MC for the SBS D 네, forum. 지금부터는 음악을 Now, 통해 we will approach our STF 2018 theme New Common Sense Individuals Changing the World. There's an artist who for the past 40 years who has been transcending genres so, as a singer, actor, DJ and voice actor. Recently, through various collaborations with the younger generation, he's bringing down the generation gap barrier and enabling communication. I think you all will be very happy to see him. Please welcome the Kim Chang-wan Band with a big hand.
Good afternoon. We are the Kim Changwan Band. The song that you just heard actually was released in 1978. Most of uh, the songs from Sanulim were actually branded as soon as they were released. We were thought of as breaking the rules. At the time, the meaning of breaking the rules was a bit different from today. It had the nuance of being impolite, having no manners, having no roots. Anyway, at the time, we thought we had done something very wrong, not only in thought, but actually in reality, our music was faced with this wall called common sense. The younger generation screamed and loved us, but the adults, the elderly, those who chose what channel to watch on TV and listen to on the radio would say, is that a song? Now that time has passed, do you think this stigma has disappeared? No. Once you are branded, you are branded for life. Then, has that stigma been transformed into a middle now? That now that we live in a different time? No, I don't think so. A stigma is a st stigma. Maybe I am here today because there are those who want to accuse me of my crime of breaking the rules decades ago. In my youth, it was a trend amongst the young generation to have long hair. And males who carried long hair really bothered the older generation. Police would wait around the corner to cut off their hair with scissors and hair clippers. This actually happened in the K-pop world, too. Songs actually at the time were called three-minute long pieces of art. But just the intro part of our song lasted more than three minutes, so we too were cut off like long hair. The broadcasting stations told us to come back with a shortened version, and we made these donut versions that we had to submit to the broadcasting stations. That was the kind of stigma that stuck to me and to us. They say it isn't the strong that survive, but those who survive are strong. Common sense is a collection of things that survived. survived. Therefore, it can only be strong. Failure and disappointment can serve as the foundation of common sense. And even branded music like ours can take root and blossom. That, I think, is the power of common sense. Actually, in hindsight, the harsh bias actually proved to be pruning for our music. How will the common sense of today cut out tomorrow? What new common sense will bother and badger today's young generation, and how? Now, I would like to play our next song.
It was probably late summer. We are at the end of autumn. People sometimes ask me who I am or which occupation do I go by on paper. I have been DJing at SBS Power FM for more than 20 years. But I still get these letters saying they didn't know I was also a radio DJ. People have different viewpoints and opinions on me. That morning DJ, that's the guy who always plays a bad guy. Wow, that's weird. Some say. And some say, what's a Sanulim rock band guy doing there? So people see me the way they want to. So it's no use insisting that I am this or that kind of person. But in truth, I am living the life according to the motto I have set for myself since I was a teenager. Back then, I told myself I would not be tied down by my own self. I wanted to be formed by the world around me, not only by myself. So I was always trying not to describe me, trying not to describe myself in definite terms. Just like a nomad never sleeps in the same place, 
I was always trying to break free of where I was. It wasn't easy, but it was also liberating. To go through all those changes, I needed something routine in my life. Because figuratively speaking, you can't get good photographs of stars in the sky if you don't have a solid foothold on the ground. So an anchor, a solid tripod in my daily life is my band, my acting, and my DJing. But every day, I feel like I'm only barely holding on to the tripod instead of photographing the stars. A few days ago, a stranger looked at me and said, out of the blue, hey, that's a celebrity, and just passed me by. I stared after that person. It felt really, really weird. Why did I expect that person to say, nice to meet you, instead? I realized I was only thinking along the lines of common sense, and I was trapped in these conventions. I had to once again break free of myself. Everything I do, they all require an audience. I have to have someone facing me, just like you are facing me now. The person was quite rude, just commenting that that's a celebrity and passing me by. That incident had put me down, but I suddenly remembered what I most enjoyed in my youth. I loved being alone. I loved solitude. I want to say to all the young people out there, standing in front of an audience, what is even more frightening than that is standing alone, facing yourself. And so it's so reassuring to have you looking at me from the audience.
네. 지구가 왜 돌까? Why does the earth go round? That was the title of the song. Does anybody know why the earth goes round? Actually, many thought in the past that planets revolved around the earth. And that is how we thought of the universe. But then, Copernicus said the sun doesn't revolve around the earth. The earth revolves around the sun in 1543. And then after that, Bruno Tepper Galileo also stressed this. But uh, the Roman Catholic Church actually only recognized this in 1992. So it took 440 years for this fact to become common sense. And this common sense made today. I really look forward to what future today's common sense will bring. Our final song is Let's Ride Our Motorcycle with Our Guitar.
감사합니다. Thank you so much. Thank you.
네, 여러분 아름다운 무대를 만들어주신 김창원 밴드에게 다시 한번 뜨거운 박수 보내주시기 바랍니다. 네, 여러분 많이 즐기셨나요? 자, 지금부터는 Now we would like to wrap up and summarize the new common sense we have been exploring together all day. Let's have another look at the highlights of each speaker's message today. Whatever stops and blocks us, our voice can overcome this. Society won't change with just you, one person screaming. At least I changed. Breaking the silence and having the courage to speak out is when the healing of the victim starts. I, we, will not stop to raise our voice. It is not the strong who survive, but those who survive who are strong. Common sense is a collection of what survived. We have to make our own standards. I started believing in myself. I'm only 18. I will continue to change. Individuals, they are all the main protagonist. I hope you will do well. We need to stop this blind faith in algorithm. Everyone affected by technology should raise their voice and contribute. The future of blockchain is a world where everyone has ownership. Not just thoughts, but in concrete action. An enhanced democracy and in search of a new model for cooperation. 네, 여러분, 어떻게 보셨습니까? How was it? We have gathered our wisdom to find a new common sense. I sincerely hope today was valuable to you in making you think about this meaningful issue crucial to this new era. With this, we will wrap up SBS D Forum, New Common Sense, Individuals Changing the World. Thank you to our participants, our viewers, and our visionaries who filled SBS D Forum with their meaningful lectures. Thank you and goodbye. An announcement. The winners in the hashtag event are being posted on the screen, so please pick up your uh, gifts on your way out in the lobby. Thank you.